Hi everyone and welcome to episode five of Cards on the Table with me, Joe Larkin. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Stuart Carrington, who is a refereeing psychology expert, author and lecturer. Stuart, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks Joe. How are you? Yeah, all good. Uh, thanks for giving the time up today. Um, like I said there, you've got a, quite a vast experience within the refereeing field and we've got some interesting topics to talk about first. Um, but could you tell us about how you perhaps became involved in refereeing in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a common question I get asked. I mean, the, my background is, you know, playing and coaching football. Um, and when I wrote the book, I, I wasn't a referee. That's something that came about as a result of writing the book where I wanted to kind of do a little bit of research and almost test myself and see if some of the things that I was talking about kind of, you know, sort of you know, uh, shed any light on the subject further in the practical application of it. And, um, you know, how I got into refereeing a book is, like I said, coming from that coaching and playing background, I had all the questions that people ask when they see or watch referees. And some of them, uh, I think, are valid questions, you know, kind of like, why hasn't the referee shown a card there or why has the referee done that? And then some are, frankly, kind of naive or perhaps a little bit ignorant questions, you know, like, oh, this ref's a bit arrogant or why, how can, this ref doesn't know what they're doing and, you know, things like this. So what I wanted to look at was, you know, is there any truth in those statements? And rather than just looking at kind of like anecdotal evidence, um, what I wanted to do in the book is, yeah, I wanted to kind of get those comments that you might see on social media or pundits talk about after a game or match of the day or something like that. And then kind of look at it really objectively and think, you know, is there actual scientific evidence uh, or like field research that's been done that might help us answer those questions in a more informed way? And just through engaging with that research, I, you know, originally I just wanted to write a few chapters just for like kind of personal interest. And then after engaging with that research, I just found it grew and grew and grew. And I started to explore all these little avenues that, I, you know, I didn't even know existed. Um, you know, in the book, I talk about the influences on a referee, but then I also end up in the second part talking about like the sociological impact. So how society views a referee and the historical development of the referee and how that influences our psychology, um, you know, culturally different nations and how they perceive referees. And then eventually it ended up kind of, you know, culminating in this can referees develop psychological skills? Can we train referees psychologically to perform better, which is very difficult because of a number of challenges, but can certainly be done. So am I right in thinking that, you know, prior to your involvement in refereeing, you had some involvement professionally at uh, different football clubs? Yes, yeah, so, uh, I, I wasn't a professional coach, but I worked on behalf of the Premier League football clubs, so coaching for those. Uh, I was really fortunate to use it, such a great experience because you just learn so much by doing, you know, as, a, as I'm investigating and discovering in the refereeing world, it's really difficult to train. So like a referee, you know, learns by doing, uh, it's, it's the same for coaching. And, and just kind of what amazed me is one, you know, as football coaches and fans, you know, we, we have this perception of match officials and, and I've been very fortunate not only to work for, for certain clubs, but also, and, and to have, you know, benefit from their coach education programs, but also, you know, it involved me traveling a lot. And one thing I noticed is that nowhere in the world talks about referees in a, in a coaching perspective. And also when people do talk about referees, it doesn't tend to be that favorable, even though they're such like an integral part of the game. And I'm just amazed, you know, that from a coaching perspective, so much emphasis is done on trying to control as much as you can. And yet, I don't know any club that will tell you, you know, yeah, this is the referee today. And this is, you know, kind of do's and don'ts for this particular individual, yeah. which, I, which I find shocking. So do you think maybe in the future, uh, I, I know it was quite a famous story a few years ago where there was quite a lot of shock when clubs started to get throwing coaches and these specific mm. coaches involved in, in the game. Mm. Do you think in the future we could see clubs get uh, referee coaches or referee uh, people with significant referee insights and maybe give them information about a certain referee on a certain game? I'm not quite sure about that, but what I do see is I kind of see it from the other direction. So I think that as we progress in the future, I think the amount of research and engagement that goes along with referee development, uh, it's only increasing, it's only going one way. And so I think that actually referees at all levels are going to be subject to a lot more support and that support is gonna come through a variety of disciplines. That's gonna come through sports science, that's gonna come through nutrition, that's gonna come through fitness and physiology. And importantly, you know, from my perspective, that's gonna come from psychological uh, perspectives as well. 
And I think by doing that, we're actually going to see improved performance and improved support for referees. And those two things actually go hand in hand, by the way, as well. So I think that's the direction it's going to go in. And do you think that is to match the standards set by some of the clubs nowadays in terms of their sports science, psychology and these departments? Yeah, you know, referees in, in the UK have been professional since 2001 and, and the professional game for players has been in existence since the 1800s. So they've got like, you know, a hundred year head start, essentially. I think referees always kind of behind the curve. I think that players and coaches will always look to try to push boundaries for a competitive edge. And, you know, that, that's not to say they're cheating. I don't, I don't think players or clubs like seek to cheat. I think what they aim to do is to try to get an advantage where possible. I think the game improves at such an incredible rate. You know, in the book, I bring out some statistics uh, about how quickly the game has developed. So, for instance, between 2008 and 2013 in the English Premier League, the pace of the game increased by 20%. So the, the speed of the players, the number of sprints they were doing, the direction of those sprints all increased uh, by approximately 20%. So automatically, from a positioning point of view, that's a, that's a tremendous burden to place on a referee. I think really interestingly is that when referees turned professional, the one comment or the one direction that everyone felt uh, that would benefit officials was fitness. So all the comments were, you know, referees are now going to be fitter, they're going to be in better positions and so on and so forth. And interestingly, if, although that has happened and they are subject to rigorous fitness tests, which people often over, overlook when they comment upon referees' physical performance, Actually, the area of development that's gone most important and identified, uh, which I do talk about in the book, is, is psychological skills training. It's, it's the one area that referees want. It's, uh, it's the one area referees demand more of. And it's the one area that's the fastest growing. So elite rugby league officials, for instance, they rank the, in the top 10 kind of attributes that they believe you need to have in order to be an elite level official. The top six are exclusively psychological. Fitness is eight. So I think actually, you know, these kind of cognitive perceptual skills, man management skills, communication skills, working as a team, uh, decision making skills, application of law, those are the kind of areas that referees would benefit from further research on. Um, I mean, in the, and in the um, you know, introduction to this, you know, before we started recording, we were talking about this discrepancy between research and players, like you just mentioned, you know, sports science teams that we see uh, sports clubs have, you know, top level football clubs have. And it's not really replicated uh, in officiating. So this, that psychological corner of the four of the four corner model, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not particularly embraced that well in officiating. There's there's some kind of valid reasons for that lack of expertise. It's difficult to see what that looks like. But additionally, it's been like, overlooked for a long time. And I, and I think to put that into perspective, if if I was to type in psychology football player or psychology football coach, I get around seven hundred and fifty thousand hits on a university database. So about you know three quarters of a million articles published on those things. Now, if I were to type in the same thing but put referee or official, I get about seventy-five thousand. So about ten percent of the research is it's nothing. So it's real fertile ground. So obviously we've touched on the book a few times there. Um, so you know blowing the whistle, the psychology of football refereeing. Um, can you tell us a bit about that journey um, and the journey before, during, um, and then maybe some of the the really key takeaways from, from that whole experience? Yeah, oh, uh, the experience of actually writing the book or takeaways from the book? Uh, well, both, yeah. Um, but yeah, specifically the, the takeaways from the book that the, you know, the listeners might be, find really interesting. Sure, yeah. The, I mean, the book is split into three parts. So the first part looks at the influences of the referee. So why do I mean influences? Well, I think one thing that people often overlook is, and, and you hear this a lot, people say a referee is there to enforce the laws of the game. Now, that's a very simple way of looking at it. That's one part of their role, and we can't get away from that. But there are other things, you know, ensuring player safety, for instance. And then there are other roles as well that might take a more kind of philosophical angle, you know, like en enabling an enjoyable environment, enabling, you know, good role modelling. So an ethical game of football happens that the best team on the day wins and so on and so forth. I think that... When we look at this kind of that statement, they're there to enforce the laws of the game. It just ignores this wider, you know, impact of social context, and and it's the one thing I kind of talk about in this book. This this notion of the social payoff. So sports are social; they're played in front of other people, with people. And as a, as a coach, like I see that impact happen all the time. You can see the impact your know, teammates have on each other, and we know there's this great wealth of information and research done on how coaches can produce an environment that assists players into producing elite level performances or certainly improved performances. 
but, but officials have been totally ignored on that. It's just seen as, yeah, you just go out there and apply the laws. It sounds simple, but it's really hard. You know, if, if we look at that example of Michael Oliver in that final minute of that Champions League game where Juventus have just come back from 3-0 down on aggregate to 3-3 away at the Bernabeu against Real Madrid, like tremendous Herculean effort. And then in like the 92nd minute or whatever it was, you know, he's got a penalty decision to make and he gives Madrid a penalty. And Buffon like is enraged at this possible decision and he ends up getting a red card. A lot of the commentators at this point said, well, that's a brave decision. And, and everyone like kind of, everyone just ignored that. that. Like, let's look at that word, it's brave, because he's not just applying the laws of the game. He has to apply the laws of the game, you know, resisting or trying to insulate himself from all these external pressures. And, and that's kind of what I wanted to look at. So I guess the first key takeaway from the book is that refereeing is done in a social context. And the more referees are trained and the more referees uh, are experienced, the more insulated they are from those external effects. Like they're there and it's hard to get away from uh, and they need more development, they need support. So the second, and then the second part of the book looks at refereeing in like a wider context and kind of variables that may impact that. So I've already mentioned training and experience. So that second part of the book looks at like the role of uh, the official in society. It looks at individual differences, so how a referee may frame success, what motivates them, uh, what they perceive their goals to be, for instance, how they react to stress and anxiety, which, of course, is, you know, again, very well researched with players and coaches, not so much with referees. And I present in the book, you know, what I believe to be quite concrete evidence that suggests that referees, A, shouldn't be overlooked in this area, and they're very similar to coaches in that area. And then the final part of the book is about referee development. What can we do to help referees a, insulate themselves from those uh, external influences that I talk about in part one, and also like other kind of very practical hands-on interventions that they can apply in order to improve their performance. And, you know, that may be a two, three, four percent improvement in performance, or it, you know, it could be a 20, 25 percent improvement in performance. Um, but, you know, and also regarding just the experience of writing the book, it's just tremendous. It's, it's opened up this fantastic new world for me that, like I said, you know, I wrote it just because I was interested in it. And I'm the sort of person, if I'm interested in it, I'm going to read up about it and investigate it. And one thing that's blown me away is how there's this community of, of match officials that are incredibly welcoming, incredibly, uh, you know, warm and friendly people. Uh, I have to say they have an amazing sense of humour. So one thing that blows me away when I go to RA meetings or, you know, talks to, you know, FA refereeing or whoever it may be, everyone's just got this great sense of humour and they, it all just stems from this love of the game. So it's, it's a, if anyone listening out there thinking, you know, should I give refereeing a go? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great way to socialise with like-minded people. So I think you've, you've touched on it a few times there, you know, especially around the sense of humour. You know, referees are human. And I think some people forget that when you're talking about just applying the laws of the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going back to that Michael Oliver incident, um, you know, I think we need to appreciate, I'm sure you have, that Michael Oliver will know the context of that situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was the narrative that Buffon was meant to win the Champions League that year and it was mm -hmm. going to be his year. Um, and Michael Oliver is going to be very aware of that when deciding whether to send him off. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something that you would uh, agree with? Yeah, there's, there's certainly one, yeah, 100% he's aware of those uh, influences. What's, what's really interesting is, you know, I've been very fortunate um, to be able to speak and interview elite level officials, um, so, you know, UEFA, FIFA listed officials throughout my uh, career so far. And, and one thing that constantly is kind of comes back is that when a, when a match official makes a decision, like a big decision at that level, it's, it's instinctive. You know, one, one really nice way of putting it came from um, a UEFA and FIFA official that I interviewed. He said, like, I've blown the whistle before I've known I've blown the whistle or the cards out before I know I got the card out. So they're acting autonomously. The reason that's important is from a psychological point of view, we know that performers do best, like elite performers do best when they act autonomously. So you think about like a, you know, a, a footballer, I'm trying to, you know, if you, if you like you know, a striker like Harry Kane or Lionel Messi or Lewandowski or whatever, you know, when they score a great goal and, you know, the match of the day pundit sticks a microphone under their nose and says, oh, tell me what you did. They don't go, oh, you know, well, I wanted to make sure I was balanced and physiologically or biomechanically I did this because they don't know, right? They just go, I hit it and it went in. So they just do it automatically. Um, and often, you know, people go, oh, they must know where the goal is. Whatever. That's automatic. That's a skill they've developed over time. So from these interviews, you know that referees feel the same. 
So interesting, it kind of suggests two things. So the first thing is, although Michael Oliver will be very aware of those contexts, in the heat of the moment, he's not thinking about those, okay? Now that comes through experience. So a lot of these referees by their own admission will say, in my early career, I cared more about what other people thought, or maybe like I pay more attention to the impact of the crowd or the narratives and things like that. So it takes time to insulate yourself from that. Now, some people will listen to that and think, oh, okay, like I get, you know, I knew it. But actually, like think about it from a player perspective as well. You know, when I was playing in your in your formative years as a player, you know, you do the same thing. You know, you're very aware of the context. So maybe if like something goes wrong or you get a little bit of a, a rollick in from a teammate for a misplaced pass, what do you do? You know, you keep your head down, you keep it simple for the next five, 10 minutes. You know, you, you don't want to kind of do anything silly, you know, um, and you want to keep it safe. But as you get older and you, you know, become more insulated to that pressure, you just act autonomously. You just, you're just doing the actions. You're not even thinking about it. You know, and players do that. So the other thing that it suggests is that refereeing is a role-specific skill. If it's a role-specific skill, it means you can develop it. So all of that goes back to it's not just a case of applying the laws. Referees are almost like sports people in their own right. They have their own set of skills. They have their own characteristics that need to be developed. And in order to promote elite performance, they need elite training and elite guidance, much like so, a football does. So do you think, um, you say it's a very role-specific skill there. Uh, there's been a narrative for many years amongst pundits, amongst different uh, media outlets that, you know, why aren't ex-players becoming referees? And uh, mm -hmm. when they retire, why aren't they straight into the, you know, the higher echelons of the game? Yeah. Um, do you think that's really important to consider that it is very role-specific and it's not a transferable skill? 100%. It's incredibly important. This is what I wanted to do in the book. I wanted to take comments like that. So in the book, I'll, you know, I, I include, you know, media cuttings or tweets from people, sometimes fans and sometimes, you know, pundits. And, and I'll, I'll kind of want to add colour to those and say, right, well, what does the evidence say? You know, is there truth in this? And sometimes, you know, there, there can be like grains of truth in these statements. In that one, there's none. So there's just no evidence to support that. And yet it's something that's wheeled out time and time again. So you know, a good example is this one of, you know, a player should do it. There's not a shred of evidence to suggest that being a player makes you a better referee. Not one bit of evidence. Now, that's not to say that a player can't be a good referee. I'm just saying that it's not a prerequisite. You don't have to have been a good player. Now, incidentally, we look, you know, I'm a sports coaching lecturer like by trade. So I, I tend to look at things from a coaching perspective first. If we look at some great coaches, you know, the two that spring to mind, uh, uh, Ferguson and Wenger. Um, now, neither played at a really high level. Neither you would describe as an elite level footballer, in, you know, in terms of you know an all-time great. Another one would be Arrigo Saki, uh, the Milan manager. And a, a quote that I love from Saki was when he was first appointed as coach of Milan was, um, you know, kind of, who are you to tell me what to do and stuff. And one comment that he made to the Milan players is, you don't have to have been a horse to be a good jockey. It, it's, it's, a, it's exactly the same, it's like that. Um, and to give you this kind of wonderful stat that I, I talked about in the introduction to my book is if we got, the one piece of research that I engaged with was by give, putting uh, players and pitting their skills in decision-making against referees, players get about 50% of decisions right, like 50%. Now imagine what pundits and players are gonna say about a referee that gets one in two decisions right. And with referees, they get about 80% of decisions right. And bearing in mind how subjective most of the decisions are, so in a game of football, they make about 200 to 250 subjective decisions a game. To get 80% of those right is incredible, particularly when there's all these other variables like positioning and what you can actually see and viewing angle as well. So yeah, it's, it's a role specific skill and, and pundits need to be aware of that when they think, well, the answer is stick an expert in there. I think, you know, to sum up, to sum up that, that, that section there, I'd recommend anyone to go and watch, if they haven't already, when uh, Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville gave it a go. Uh, and I, yeah. and I, I think that would, that would demonstrate your point uh, in its entirety. Do you remember there was this, um, <laughs> there was a Europa League game, you may, not, may or not remember, it was kind of, you know, group stage game years ago where Tottenham uh, made their substitutes and the goalkeeper had to go off injured. So Harry yes. Kane went in goal. Yeah. And his first action was like a, a weak free kick squirmed underneath him. It's a little bit like this. It's about saying, oh, well, this guy's a professional footballer, so he can just go and goal, right? It was like, well, no, because being a goalkeeper is role-specific. Yeah. It's a very uh, particular set of skills you need to be an accomplished goalkeeper. 
So you can't just get a striker from there. Likewise, you can't stick a goalkeeper up front and expect them to do what the strikers do. It's exactly the same for officials. So uh, you've touched on it there as well. Um, you've worked with your way for officials. Um, and I'm sure a lot of referees who you know, have a keen interest in refereeing may have seen at the end of 2020, uh, UEFA TV released uh, a mini series looking into the, the previous season's Champions League and following the elite level match officials. Um, and you obviously took part in a part of that documentary. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I, well, first of all, it's such a pleasure to be involved because obviously, you know, when uh, an awarding body such as UEFA want to know your views and perspectives on things, it's just fantastic. And, you know, we actually spoke at length for a very long time um, about a lot of the issues that, you know, like the influences on a referee. And, and I think what was refreshing for me um, was not only to work with a group such as UEFA, but it was also to bring kind of you know to the mainstream or the limelight if you like these issues that i feel really important that people understand about match officials like the influences they're under the context that they have to work in and also i think what that documentary did really well was highlight the the human element to officials i really enjoyed seeing how the officials prepared traveled to games the thought process they went through and also one thing that stemmed out of some recent research of mine was how they feel after the game so it's great to see this insight into how officials react post-game particularly a post game has made a big decision you know we saw uh born creepers for instance talk about the um handball incident with tottenham v man city and you know saying oh yeah it didn't look like it to me but it was a good intervention of the ar it just shows that what match officials want to do is get every decision right or as many right as possible. If they get the right outcome, they're happy. Um, so that, that, you know, that was a great experience for me to kind of get that insight. So, you know, from all the referees that you, you spoke to within UEFA uh, or within different professional competitions, are there any that stand out to you in terms of their psychological mindset or the way they think about refereeing and approach it? Okay, yeah, so in, yeah, interesting question. Obviously, what I can't do is give away, you know, people that I've spoken to because, yeah. they, you know, we want to preserve anonymity and that's their right. And, uh, so I can't do what, I, what I will say, I, you know, so in, in that fairness, I, I won't mention names. What I will say is there are, there's an incredible mindset with elite referees that insulate them from so many contextual factors. And, and one question I often get asked is, like, do you have to be a certain type of person to be a referee? And it's a really interesting question because on the one side, sports are played with lots of people. So... You know, some players might like someone to be quite forceful and, you know, uh, assertive in their decision making. And for other players, that might not be the best approach at all. So, you know, those man management skills and, and, and relationship skills are really key for an, an effective official. One thing that I did notice, however, that all officials have is one, they're happy to take responsibility. So I think one thing that we can never accuse uh, an elite level match official of is shirking responsibility or not having courage because it's, you know, it's a thankless task, it's a tough job. I think the other thing that we need to consider with match officials is they have to have this incredible amount of intrinsic motivation. They have to really love the game. You know, we saw that with some officials where they have to do their physical training independently. A lot of the psychological training is done independently. Um, there's, you know, they're away from home frequently, traveling, particularly doing European games. You know, people forget that. So I think um, you have to be incredibly dedicated. Uh, you have to really love the game and you, and you have to not want to be in control, but you have to be happy to be in control. And I think there's a big difference there between the perception and the reality. So do you think that puts, you know, puts pay to the myths, uh, the referee's bottled it, he's not got the courage to give that, this, you know, these things that you hear pundits just throw away all the time. Uh, yeah, so that's very much a myth. I think uh, certainly at the elite level, like 100%, like you do not get to that level, in your words, by bottling a decision. I absolutely like loathe this term. And I, I loathe it from a player perspective as well, by the way. You know, it's, you know if, if, if someone misses a penalty, have they bottled the penalty? It's Or, you know, have, have they been affected by, you know, poor performance through stress and anxiety, which, okay, is that what you term bottling, in which case, well, you know, reacting to stress is like a human condition. Um, uh, is it, you know, that the goalkeeper has, you know, pulled off a really good save? And likewise, like for, for an official, we don't know what that official saw. Now, we know that, like, context can influence referees, so they know there's an area of game management. So, there's a, I mean, there's a fantastic interview that people can see on YouTube. Uh, I think it's with um, Robbie Savage, where he's talking to Howard Webb, and he's talking to him about like game management and why is it that in the first minute you're less likely to caution a player than you are later on. 
And Webb like really nicely articulates this and says, well, no, there's a reason why, like there, there are kind of sound management reasons why I may choose that course of action. And I think it's, a, it's you know, dare I say, it, it's lazy journalism just to say, oh, well, you've just bottled that decision. You don't want to show a yellow card. Like at that level, you're not going to achieve that standard by choosing to do that. You know, like you're not going to achieve that standard as a footballer by constantly, you know, bottling challenges or, you know, not showing composure in front of goal. And if you are, you're not going to last very long. And it's the same for officials. So, you know, feel free to come back on me on this. This is this is something that I've picked up when I've been watching football. It might be a myth again. Um, just touching on that aspect of game management, uh, you know, the difference between the English Premier League and UEFA competitions, uh, something which I think I might have noticed is it seems that that aspect of game management is more apparent in domestic competitions mm. uh, than it is in European competitions. For example, that, that first tackle of the game, if it's a yellow, it's a yellow in UEFA. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas perhaps domestically there's probably some more leeway is that is there any anything in that would you say again i mean what i'd like to do or i always like to do is kind of show if there's any evidence towards it because yeah. I, I know some people say we just want to know your opinion on it which i'm kind of happy to give and, and my opinion would be no i don't think there is a difference i think it's up to that individual referee um you know if we can take that a little bit further and talk about well what's the briefing so yeah. For instance, if you look at the documentary Match 64 about the 2010 World Cup, what's particularly insightful, and I guess that most people would be interested in, you know, the, the players and the teams and how they prepared for that World Cup final between Spain and Holland. But again, we talk about Howard Webb because he was the official in that in charge of that day. There's a great, you know, sequence or, or part of that uh, documentary where the FIFA officials are saying to him, you know, just bear in mind that this is a highly emotive game. You know, it's a big spectacle. I think at one point, I'm paraphrasing here, but it says, you know, like, consider every decision you make regarding red and yellow cards. And then, you know, Webb is instantly criticised for not sending off uh, De Jong for the high tackle. Whereas, first of all, Webb didn't see, like, the contact, didn't see how high his foot was. If you look at the angle and positioning he was, he wouldn't have been able to see it very well like where we did, and they didn't have VAR then. And then additionally, you know, you've kind of got this context of, well, you know, the hierarchy are telling me to do one thing. And we're not kind of privy to that information. Now, that's not to say the hierarchy is saying keep your cards in your pocket, or get your cards out as quickly as you can. But what it does suggest is that maybe there's kind of different preferences of how that governing body would like that game to be managed. And then this just all comes back, Joe, to what you were saying earlier on about, um, you know, game, not only game management, but it also comes back to what you were saying about this, like the context the referees work on. You know, are they there just to enforce the laws of the game, or are they there to kind of enable a safe game of football? Now, if they're there to enable a safe game of football and apply the laws, well, many of the laws are subject to interpretation. And also, it's you know, what do we want more of? You know, mate, if talking to does the job, is that not better for everybody? And then sometimes, and that's not to say it's, you know, uh, right or wrong, because I'm sure that some referees go off the field at the end of the game and go, oh, I probably should have shown the yellow and it may have worked better. But as a referee myself, and certainly not at a high level, you know, I'm at the lowest level. But there are games where I've gone, I probably shouldn't have shown the yellow card in that incident. It didn't help. And there's also times where I'm like, I probably should have shown the yellow card and, and I think that would have helped. So I think of what it's like at the top level, you know, you've got to make these instant decisions that are very difficult and there's you know, these kind of like very blurred lines and gray areas. So all these things, you know, your background in refereeing, uh, the book, uh, your work with UEFA, uh, I think it's fair to say this has all led you to your most recent uh, venture, which is your new uh, MSc course at St. Mary's University. Would you care to tell me a little bit more about that and how it came about? Yeah, I'd be absolutely delighted to. So we, we run a, an MSc in professional development. At the moment, there are three specialist pathways. So there's sports coaching, there's rugby coaching specialism, and then there's a performance analysis specialism. So anyone interested in those three areas at postgrad level, like St. Mary's is the place to be to, to kind of get this specialist MSc in those areas. But what we want to do is constantly grow and evolve and, and add programs to this suite of, suite of courses that can give people, you know, very bespoke, very specialized postgrad qualifications. And Obviously, what we're adding and it's launching in September this year is this MSc in sports, uh, sports officiating on the professional development pathway. So students will do the core units that all professional development students do. So these are things, for instance, such as strategic leadership in high performance, 
uh, professional development and mentoring, and they also want to do an, uh, an academic independent project, so a, a dissertation or thesis in that particular area, for instance. But then there's also the bespoke modules, which you know, I'm really delighted with. So these bespoke modules for sports officials were designed in collaboration with some very key partners. So we, we worked with the Referees Association, we worked with the Surrey FA, and we worked with Sports Official UK. And together, you know, we kind of combined to kind of this bespoke kind of range of modules. So these are the psychology of sports officiating, which obviously is a particular favourite of mine. Uh, then we look at what's called the holistic official. So we look at social, cultural and interpersonal challenges for an official. So, for instance, you know, game management, for instance, communication with uh, players and also communication with the governing body, communication with your teammates on the day, you know, your assistants, for instance. Um, we also look at like the social and cultural side of it as well. So how does the society or the culture that you are operating in impact your performance and how can you help? either embrace or resist certain uh, influences found within those. And then finally, we have a very philosophical uh, module or base module where we look at ethics, morality, and integrity in sports. So we kind of dissect the laws of the game and the governance of the game and think about, you know, the referee is a custodian, if you like, of standards in the game. So what dilemmas might a referee face uh, or an umpire in any sport face uh, if there's you know, immoral behavior? How do they uphold the integrity of the game? When's it right to make a decision, you know, that maybe doesn't contravene laws, but, you know, kind of goes against the ethical kind of fibre of the game? Um, are laws or should there be laws that are changed or developed? And we look at it from that kind of perspective. So I think, you know, there's this great scope for potential students to really improve their knowledge of all these different areas of officiating. And, you know, one thing we mentioned right at the beginning is this, there's a very much a lack of research. The number of research articles is only going up. 50% of research in this area has occurred within the last five years. So it's one of the most contemporary areas of sports academic research. So if that's happened in the last five years, what I'd urge you know, potential students to think about is what kind of roles are going to be uh, existent in, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years? We mentioned you know, at the beginning sports clubs getting throwing coaches and nutritionists and psychologists and so on and so forth. You know, think about what's going to be happening at, you know, RAs and, and county FAs and referee development officers and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's no surprise that, you know, at the moment, you know, four of the elite Premier League officials were former RDOs. So yeah. like, people that want to kind of basically people that accumulate knowledge, uh, invest time to like, strategize and try to improve their knowledge base, improve their performance by, by extension. And I believe you've got a sort of an introductory session to that coming up? We sure do, yeah. So on the 25th of March at 7 p.m., we've got a fantastic webinar lined up that RA members will be really interested in because it focuses on football. So although the courses for officials and umpires in any sport, and we have another webinar in April that's going to look at other sports, this one is particularly solely football-based. And we've got four excellent speakers. So we've got obviously two that most football fans would have heard of. And that's Anthony Taylor, who's obviously the first man since 1901 to officiate two FA Cup finals. And we also have Rebecca Welch, so you know, one of the leading female uh, referees in the Women's Premier League. And then we also have Dan Neeson, who's the referee development officer for the, um, for the FA. And we also have Joe Fletcher, who is a Canadian official, now retired, who uh, was not only one of the senior management teams in uh, leading the assistant referee program for the PRO, which is the PGMO equivalent in the United States. But also he was the well, one of the assistant referees uh, in the 2018 World Cup game between England and Colombia, where England finally won a penalty shootout. And he's gonna be talking about working as a team going into a World Cup. So I think like that experience um, from an overseas official and obviously such a you know, juicy game, if you like, you know, there'll be some great questions and answers there. And it's totally free to register. So anyone, you know, that wants to come and listen to these wonderful speakers talk about this fascinating subject, um, all they need to do is to go onto the St. Mary's website, uh, click on the sports officiating course, and then you can register there via the link or follow me on social media and, and I'll show you some links on there and uh, people can register, get the link and come and enjoy what should be a really nice evening listening to some expert speakers. No, we'll be uh, we'll be sure to put the link in our uh, description on the YouTube video and uh, via our, via our website too, so our members or referees can uh, can access that. 
Um, well, Stuart, all that's left for me to say is, well, thanks for your time. Uh, I personally found that really, really interesting and insightful. Um, and I'm sure the listeners will too. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me on.